There's a famous passage where uh, Vajapati Kudami, the Buddha's stepmother, after her ordination, comes to see the Buddha and asks for a brief Dharma teaching. And he teaches her eight principles for deciding what is Dharma and Vinaya and what's not. And those principles can be applied in two directions. One, when you hear somebody teach the Dharma, you ask yourself, what kind of behavior would this Dharma inspire in, inside me, in my actions, in my relationship with other people, in my own practice, in the goal that I've set, which is for total freedom? But you can also apply those principles to your own thoughts, because as you're meditating, directed thought and evaluation is part of the practice. But once you've made up your mind to direct your thoughts to the breath and evaluate the breath, it's not the case that you will always be directing them there, or all, that all thoughts will go in that direction. So you want to learn how to Evaluate when something comes up in the mind. Is it Dharma or is it not? One of the first principles, of course, is the principle used with regard to speech. The Buddha was challenged one time as to whether he would say anything negative, anything displeasing to other people. And the challenge was this. If he said that he would, then the response would be, well, what's the difference between you and just ordinary people out in the market? If he said he wouldn't, well, he was on record for having said some things to Devadatta that Devadatta didn't like, so they thought they had the Buddha. But when the question was posed, he said, well, there's no categorical answer to that question. And he set forth the principles that he would use in deciding what to say. One, it had to be true. Two, it had to be beneficial. And three, he had to choose the right time and place to say something pleasing, and the right time and place to say something displeasing. And the displeasing things there were not just to put people down or to make them feel bad. They were to alert them that something they were doing was wrong. And if they themselves were not alerted, maybe the people who were listening in would be alerted. So when thoughts come up in the mind, as you're sitting and meditating, for the time being the rule is anything that's not related to the meditation is not relevant. No matter how true the thought may be, no matter how beneficial it would ordinarily be in other times and places, it's not relevant to what you're doing right now. This is not the right time and place. And as for critical voices that come up. Again, ask yourself, is this compassionate criticism or uncompassionate? Because when the Buddha gave the example of what would be the right time and place to say something displeasing, he gave an analogy. Suppose a child has taken something sharp in its mouth. What do you do? We hold the child's head with one hand. And with your finger you take the object out, even if it means drawing blood. Why is that? Because you have compassion for the child. You don't want the child to swallow it. In the same way, when the Buddha would say something displeasing, it was for the purpose of alerting the person with a compassionate motive. So when critical voices come up in the mind, you can ask yourself, are these helpful? Because they fall in with one of the principles that the Buddha taught to Mahapachapati, which is that true Dhamma encourages effort. And encouraging effort doesn't mean just telling you you've got to get going. It also means that if it's really encouraging, it tells you you can do this. You're capable of doing this. It's real encouragement. So any critical voices come up while you're meditating, and they are discouraging. They belittle the good that you've done. They belittle you. Okay, no, those voices are not dharma. 
It's very easy for critical voices to sound like Dharma, because a lot of what the Buddha has to say about our ordinary behavior is pretty critical. So much of the path that teaches that we have to abstain from this, abstain from that. And some of the things we're told to abstain from are things we've been doing all along. But again, the criticism is there out of a compassionate motive, and it's for the purpose of alerting you that changes can be made, and you're capable of doing them. So when critical voices come up, remember, there are standards for criticism. This self as commentator that you have inside. Remember, you have many selves. And not all of them mean well. Not all of them are on the side of the path. Some of them would prefer that you leave the path, and so they disguise themselves as Dharma. They make the path seem impossible, or make you seem incapable. So as you train yourself, remember, yourself, as it relates to the path, takes on three main roles. One is the self as producer, the you who is capable of doing this. Self as consumer, the you who will benefit, will experience happiness as a result of doing the path. And then the self as commentator. And so you want yourself as commentator to encourage the producer to higher standards. But at the same time, to really encourage, i.e., the old literal meaning of the word, to encourage, to give you heart, give you the willpower, give you the confidence that, yes, you can do this, and it is worthwhile. The good that you've done is good. Just that it could be better. This is one of the problems of the critical voices. Sometimes they set impossible goals. Or they set a possible goal, but you're not there yet. And they criticize everything you do that falls short of that. But remember, the path is a path of success by approximation. Every step in the right direction is something to be encouraged. You know that it, you're not all the way there yet. But there's value in making progress, heading in the right direction. And that way, yourself as a consumer has a better and better chance of actually experiencing something of real worth inside. So as you're training yourself here on the path, remember you're training yourselves. Teach the commentator to be, to be more realistic and generally encouraging, so that what it has to say is genuine dharma, i.e. it's encouraging you to put forth extra effort, makes you want to put forth extra effort, and helps you figure out how to do it. That's the commentator you want. And then you train the producer. The one who actually sits down and does the work. That way you will benefit. I notice there's a lot of yous in there. The question comes up, well, what about this teaching on not-self? We learn how to not identify with all the unskillful voices in there, all the unskillful selves. But that doesn't mean you drop all sense of self. You can't say, well, just let the path do itself, or let causes and conditions do the path. Causes and conditions acting on their own are not going to get the path done. And even when the Buddha was teaching not self to the monks, he said, whatever is not yours, let go of it. That will be for your long-term welfare and happiness. Listen to that phrase, your well, long-term welfare and happiness. That's the self as consumer is going to benefit. You use that as part of your motivation. As you get further and further on the path, 
that sense of self will get more and more refined. The happiness that you can produce gets more refined. The actions that need to be done get more refined. And the commentator gets more and more refined and precise until they refine themselves out of a job. That's when you can put them aside. So remember, think of your senses of self as strategies, as tools, and look carefully in your toolbox. Because some of the tools in the box may actually be harmful. You look in the toolbox and all you have is a sledgehammer, which smashes everything. Well, that doesn't help. You want to design your tools so they really do help get the job done. Work on your strategies so they really do get the job done. This is all something you can do. There's nothing superhuman about this. One of the nice things about the Buddhist teachings is it was they were created by someone who knows what it's like to be imperfect. You have other religions where a perfect being comes down and tells you what to do. And that being has never understood what it's like to be imperfect. The Buddha made mistakes. He learned how to recognize his mistakes. And he didn't let his mistakes get him down. He learned from them and kept refining his actions. So he knows what it's like not to be perfect and to be on your way. And now you should give your encouragement to yourself every step along the way. Because if you don't believe it can, you can do it, it's not going to get done. But that is a choice. So choose the possibility of awakening. You may not get there in this life, but at least you're headed in the right direction. And a life headed in the right direction is a life well lived.